Okay, good morning everyone. Um, just uh, two announcements to get started with. Firstly, uh, if you've not had a chance to pick up your midterm from me, I've got some of them here today with me. I'll be able to hand that back to you afterwards. And then secondly, uh, most of you have booked a meeting slot for the 4G project. Many of you have had that meeting already on Friday. Um, the rest of you will have it today and uh, Wednesday. If you've not booked your meeting slot, there's a few more spots left for Wednesday. And of course, the meeting is mandatory. It's, or, I mean, or it's not mandatory, but it counts for grades, so it's, it's up to you. Um, if there's not enough meeting slots, just let me know and I can try and make a few more available, but I think what's there is sufficient. So let's, um, let's just quickly recap the process we've been going through the past few classes. We've looked at a significant amount of nonlinear optimization. And we've looked at, in particular, the last two classes, the method with penalties and the method with Lagrange multipliers. And so that's wrapped up now. We've had a number of examples of that in class, and uh, you've had some good practice. What I thought to bring in here at this point was a topic that's seemingly important um, to many of your projects. It's because a number of you have selected projects where you're using Aspen or some sort of simulator such as BioWin, um, I wanted to make sure that we address this carefully so that you can solve this in a meaningful way. It's typically something that we, we brush over when we teach regular optimization, but actually looking at the meetings I've had with you, I thought to bring it in more formally and let's address it so we're all, um, we're all very clear on this topic. Even though you may not use it for your project, this is still really helpful. So the situation is as follows. You're sitting in front of Aspen and you're trying to optimize a flow sheet. And you might be doing this in 4W right now, or you might have done this in 4N, where you're trying to change something on the flow sheet, such as the column size, in other words, the number of trays in the column, or you might be changing the reflux ratio, or you might be changing the feed throughput through the column, or the duty in the column. So you've got a very small number of search variables, five or six. And if you've done this manually, you would have typically just gone and changed these values one at a time. So change reflux up, see what happens. Change reboiler ratio, see what happens. And you get a sense for cause and effect. Right? And you can build up a fairly good model in your mind quite quickly what happens when you change one variable and its effect on the outcome. Now I've not defined outcome because of course if you're in 4W, your outcome variable might be um, capital costs. Or if you're in 4N, your outcome variable might be the net present value. Okay? Either of those are nonlinear functions. We know from 4n and 4w that capital costs scale according to some coefficient times a cost to an exponent. So an exponent of 0.8 or 1.2. That exponent is not, not equal to 1. So this is already a nonlinear function. The NPV formula, net present value, is a summation of several terms divided by 1 plus i raised to the n. There's some nonlinearity in that formula, though, not necessarily in your search variables. Okay, so either, either way, you've got, you've got this set up, and, and you've done this, and you've probably, hopefully, just done it in Excel. You've not just simply put in values and, and try to keep all the results in your mind, though that's quite feasible. But if you're doing it somewhat systematically, you're doing it in Excel. But you're still doing it by trial and error because I know what you're doing. I've done this myself. Right? You sit there and you just play around with the numbers and you're like, okay, this cost looks fairly minimum or this NPV looks, looks like a maximum and you call it a day. What we're going to look at here is a way to do that but more systematically. Because when you're going into Aspen and BioWin and you're running each one of these simulations, the key distinction between this approach to optimization, this brute force trial and error approach versus anything else we've looked at before is that you don't know the function that you're trying to optimize. Or you might know the function, like you might know that it's got this shape, but you don't know what these coefficients are. Okay, so in bio, when you know what the nonlinear bioreactor equations underlying the system, or in Aspen, you know that there's vapor liquid equilibrium equations and column equations for the distillation column and so on, but you know they're nonlinear, but you don't know the coefficients in them. So if you don't know f of x, then everything we've learned in this course can't be used. 
You cannot do anything without knowing what f of x is. You can't even go calculate the first derivative of f of x, which is shown up over and over, right? because you don't even have the function to start with. And you might say, well, I can calculate the function value. I can calculate f of x given a value of x. So in Aspen, you go put in a reflux ratio, might be one of your x variables, and you can go calculate your f. And then if you go tweak x up a little bit by some amount h, and then you subtract from it minus f of x, and then you divide through by h, you can go approximate derivatives. Right? So you can go try and Aspen do like a quasi-Newton method yourself. And that's quite OK. But this is going to quickly get very, very messy when x is especially more than one variable. So if you're now trying to optimize with reflux ratio and feed flow rate and number of trays in your column, you're now trying to fit partial derivatives in three variables. And then you're going to be doing so many Aspen simulations, you're not going to keep track of things. So let's take a look at what we call here in this handout direct search methods. So direct search optimization. You can go evaluate f of x. And the most distinguishing feature of direct search methods is that evaluating f of x is expensive. OK, so it means that in Aspen, you have to go in and manually change all your x values for the variables you're trying to tweak. Click solve, and solve might take one minute, or it might be a quick conversion if you're lucky. But the key is that it's not, it's not trivial to just get successive values of f of x quickly. There's a lot of tediousness involved. Okay? Now, for those of you that are in 4C optimization, you can start to draw some parallels between what we're covering in that course right now versus this topic. There's a lot of similarities. There's some differences. And if we have some time, we can talk about that. But um, what we're covering here is a, is a different variation. So what I hope to really emphasize, as in 4C, is not to use trial and error. Let's go use a systematic approach, because we can then often get this done in fewer function evaluations than just sit there mindlessly putting in different values of x. So the approach that we're going to cover is the Nelda Mead method. It's the most well-known and, if not, most successful approach to doing this. There's several other uh, direct search methods, but Nelda Mead is very, very popular. It's, if you search it and the publication that described the algorithm is one of the most cited scientific papers in the world. It's in the top 10. So it's used in every single area, biology, systems, astrology, uh, uh, astrophysics, and so forth. So we're going to look at the case of minimizing. However, the, in the usual way, if you're maximizing, you just sub in minus f of x. And it uses what we call a simplex. Now, here again, when we say simplex, we're not referring to the LP method, the simplex method. Simplex is also a geometrical word. That means a shape, such as shown over here, where you connect the number of points with straight lines. So if you've got a two-dimensional case, your, a simplex in two dimensions is a triangle. So two dimensions, n equals 2. You always have n plus 1 points. So you've got three points in two dimensions. Connect them with straight lines, and you get a triangle. If you've got three search variables, so say reflux ratio, number of trays, and feed flow rate in your distillation column, now n is equal to 3. You have four points, n plus 1 points. Connect them with a straight line, and you get that shape there, a tetrahedron. Now, to make things a little easier for us in the class, we're going to deal with the simplest case of a triangles moving around. But you'll see that all the formulas I've given to you, I've left general. I haven't made the formulas specific to the 2D case. I've left them as an n-dimensional because I know those of you doing your projects on this are going to have more than two search variables. Okay, so you can go and take the formulas we're learning today and scale it up to this case here. OK, so let's, um, let's take a look then at the very first step that the Neldemede method does. So Neldemede simply says, we don't know f, the function, but we can go calculate it. And we start by calculating the function at three points. So choose any three points, 
Remember, we've got two search variables, x1 and x2. These are my two search variables that I'm trying to move around to try and locate that optimum over here. And it's a minimization problem, so we want to head downhill. So pick any three starting points, n plus 1 starting points. One will be your base case, and you can just go pick two others and form a triangle. So that's easy. That's totally up to you to decide where you go place those three points. No one specifies that the triangle needs to have 90 degrees or anything. You can, any triangle you like, any shape you want. All you go do is you go evaluate your function three times. So now you've got three f values, f of x1, f of x2, and f of x3. And you go write them down in order from best to worst. So call x1 the location where you get your best function value. So we're trying to minimize. So x1 should be the point where you get your lowest f. So if you're trying to minimize cost, put the lowest cost function value and call that x1. Then your next highest cost, you call x2. And your third highest cost, you call x3. So the key is here, you, lo you, you specify where the triangle is. You evaluate the function values, and then you go assign the names 1, 2, and 3, from lowest to highest. So we, we call this direction, um, find the, sorry, in, no, in non-improving sequence is what we call that. OK, so you get your three values ranked from low to high. Now, let's draw this visually here in this case. We're, again, we'll always do it geometrically and algebraically. So if I've got my three values, which direction should I head to improve my objective, to minimize? Well, down, towards that corner, OK? But we don't have, remember, these contours. Yeah, Ihima? If you're going to maximize something. We're minimizing. If you're maximizing, oh, it's flip. You flip. Okay. You just evaluate minus f of x. Yeah. OK, so I'll only deal with max minimize, but conceptually, it's the same in maximizing. OK, so you don't know these green contours. But all you have is these three values. So the best we can do is figure that we want to be, relative to these three points, we want to be further down. That's all we know, is we want to be further down. So the insight, or the, the, what Neldermead method came up with, is simply say, this is your worst function value up here, x3, remember? x1 is your best, x2 is medium, x3 is your worst. So drop that point out connect these two with a straight line and find the middle point. Okay, so that's called the centroid. So drop out your worst point, find your centroid along the two best other, uh, the two other points and the straight line connecting them. And we're going to take x3 and flip it over and land up over there. So x3 is going to move from there to there. Yeah. OK, so yeah, this, this is the key point here. So this distance, x3 to the centroid, that's my step. And I'm just going to take it and shift it down. OK, so start at your centroid and then add a value called delta x. Well, what is delta x? Let's calculate that algebraically. Delta x is the value xc minus the worst point. So xc minus x3 in this case is delta x. In two dimensions, n, n is equal to 2. So in two dimensions, here we see that the definition for delta x, our step, is the centroid value minus the worst data point. So here's the centroid. Just let's look at this diagram. Here's my centroid. There's my worst data point. That amount is delta x. We're going to start at the centroid and simply add delta x to it. So that's that amount given by the arrow. Okay. The minus is just because we're. The minus is we just want to calculate how much of a step to make. So the delta is this distance from xc to x3, and then just add it on to xc. Now, that's easy in two dimensions. Now, 
I want to emphasize that as you can see here, the formulas I'm giving to you, I'm not going to sub in n equals 2. I'm going to leave it generic for those of you doing this in your project. So if you want to calculate the centroid, it's simply this function. Let's read this. To calculate that location, xc is 1 over 2, if you're in two dimensions, so half of x1 plus x2. So that's in intuitive. Take x1 plus x2, sum them up and divide by 2. That gives you the midpoint over there. Okay? So that's how we locate xc. Add to it a delta x. Now that step that we've done over there, if you want to draw it di geometrically, we've taken that point, we've gone and we've reflected it over to there. We're going to call that xr, the reflected amount, xr. So we've taken my x3 and I've flipped the triangle over, folded it on itself. So this distance over here is exactly the same as that distance there, the distance of delta x. And we'll go and evaluate the function at this location here. If that function value, so f of xr, lies between the best function value and the nth function value. So remember, I've got three data points. So if this reflected value lies between my, my best function value and my middle function value, then we keep that reflected point. It's an improvement. Okay. And what we're going to do then is drop that prior point out, and then my new triangle is going to be that reflected triangle. So all the simplex method does is it, it just goes and moves this triangle around in the space to try and approach the optimum. Yeah, so we're going to come down here. Oh, yeah, sorry. yeah. This, uh, this algorithm has several branches. So we're just looking at the one branch of trying to reflect. OK. Now, let's say we, we reflect and we get a better f, f of x. Why not go a step further? Why not go twice as far? Similar to line search, right? You're, you're being adventurous. If you're going in this direction and it's improving, well, why stop there? Why not go a little further still? So we go do that, and we call that expansion. So we've, the reflection calculation is shown here. The expansion calculation follows exactly the same approach. Then instead of going 1 delta x, so we've, to reflect, we've gone from f of x, c, plus delta x. That is called expansion. Oh, sorry. Let me correct that. That's called reflection. We can go take a, s a larger step of 2 times x, delta x. And we call that expansion. So the way we can conceive of this is actually just imagine there's an alpha value over there. And this reflection step is alpha equals 1, and expansion is alpha equals 2. Okay, so, and then for those of you that prefer a more geometric picture, we can consider that reflection. And expansion, then, is you're going twice as far. Okay, so expansion is going 2 alpha, and reflection is going 1 alpha. And if this function over here at the expansion is better, we'll go, we're going to keep that point. If it's not better, we're going to go back to what we had and keep the reflection. So it's sort of like an exploration. You go check. If the expansion function is, is improved, keep it. If not, go back to where you were with reflection. Because think of it, right, you might be going, getting to the optimum, and now you're overshooting the optimum.
Okay, so we want to always keep our best available points to us. Okay, everyone clear on reflection and expansion? Okay, those are the first two major steps in the simplex method for Nelda Mead. Now, you could also imagine a situation, I'll show it to you geometrically, where reflection doesn't improve anything and expansion doesn't improve anything. Well, then what we're going to do is the opposite. We're going to call that a contraction next. We're going to try that instead. Okay, so let's look at this geometrically. Here's x1, x2, and x3. And x1 is my best search point, x2 is the middle, x3 is the worst. And the contour lines emphasize that, right? So here's the contour lines, that's the lowest value, x2 is next highest, and x3 lies beyond that contour, so it's the worst function. So when we find that centroid, xc now is easy to find, our first step is to go try and do a full expansion of one alpha. So, sorry, I, I, I'm going to keep screwing this up. I should be saying reflection. So do a full reflection of one alpha. That lands up over there, alpha equals one. And what we notice is that that point down there, the function value for this is higher than x1. And this function value at xc, that new tentative point, is even higher than x2. In fact, that function value down there lies somewhere between x2 and x3. So this point here, that expand uh, reflection is gone too far so what we're going to do is let's pull back a little bit so instead of going a full one alpha let's go a half alpha instead so in this particular scenario that point over there lies between x1 and x2 and we'll rather keep that new point and on the next iteration my simplex is going to be from this point x1 to that point over there half an alpha and x2, and I'm going to drop x3. So you, what you notice then is my triangle actually gets a very different shape, becomes more thin and narrow connecting those two points, and I'm going to drop x3 out. Your xc, your center point is never part of your triangle? No, xc is, is a fictitious centroid mid midpoint. Okay, everyone clear on that geometric picture there? Okay, so instead of taking a full alpha step, that go, that's going to make me worse off. I'm going to pull back a little bit and take alpha equals a half. And then my new triangle on the next iteration is going to be those three points there. Mark? What if you make a triangle that encases your <coughs> Yeah, we're going to get to that next. That's even the next step. So everyone's thinking a step ahead, which is great. OK, so let's uh, take one more look at uh, contraction, which doesn't su succeed. Here's x1, x2, x3. We form that triangle. Here's my centroid this time. If I take a full step, a full reflection, x3 gets flipped over and lands over there. That's much worse off. If I, even if I come back in at half, half an alpha is over there. That half alpha is going to lie, watch my finger, I'm going to trace it with a contour line. Half an alpha comes out around here. It's still this side of x2, so it's, it's not any improvement really. So what we'll actually do is we, ref we contract inwards, interior, into the triangle. So we come in by minus alpha in that scenario. Okay. So a lot of different branches that you could potentially follow, and I've got them all listed at the bottom of the page coming up. So don't worry about the details if you're trying to implement this as an algorithm. The rule is simply that if x2 here exceeds the value of our new point, we're going to then ref come in and subtract by half an alpha. OK, so that's called my contraction step. And if this new point gets me an improvement, I'm going to keep it. So let's see what my triangle would be afterwards. This new point is better. So I'm going to keep x1 is my best point, x2. And this new point, my triangle is actually going to come inside. And x3 is going to drop off. OK. What I want you to notice is that every single time we do this, we only actually evaluate the function one more time, because we're going to keep the prior two function values. So this process is actually very efficient from a function evaluation point of view. 
OK, so there's one other approach, one last branch, I should say, that doesn't succeed. And that's what Mark alluded to, is what if neither expansion, nor reflection, nor contraction gets you any improvement? OK, that's going to happen typically when you're close to the objective function. And then we're going to shrink. Okay, so when you're close to the objective function, imagine you're trying to minimize, you're in a, in, a, in a bowl shape. And if your triangle's branches or arms are so big, you're, anytime you reflect, you expand, or you contract, you're not going to actually get an improvement. It's because your triangle is too big. You need to bring your triangle in. So as you approach the optimum, typically we will find, as asked here, when does this generally occur? You, shrink, you have to shrink in your triangle when you get closer to the optimum. So you get more sensitivity to finding that exact optimum. Now, shrinking is done as follows. Let's take the formula here. It's written out carefully. We will shrink inwards towards our best point. So here's my best point. What we're going to do then is shrink x2 and x3, slide them inwards, and then get a new triangle as shown over here. Okay, so you slide or shrink towards your best point, x1. <coughs> so if you're in n dimensions, that's the formula for shrinking. Okay, so we've seen a lot of new theory. Now we need, it's time for a bit of a um, video to see this in action. So let's take a look at this. Um, this is not my doing. This is a, a video from Wikipedia. What I have done, though, is modified it down uh, and slowed it down because it goes really quick on Wikipedia. So let's um, just even pause here. I'm going to demonstrate the whole algorithm to you on this function. This function has four potential optima. The one that is going to converge to, the, however, is this location. Okay? And you're going to see it's, it's like a spider walking around on the surface trying to get to the minimum. And we're going to start with this particular triangle over there. Which way do you think the triangle is going to move after this iteration? If you had to guess. The minimum, the minimum is, is here. So the, the contour lines sink down to that point. Take a look at the function values. There's f of x1, 2, 3, 3, 2, 1. Which one is 1, 2, and 3? OK, so what's the triangle going to do next? OK, let's see if we're right. Okay. Is that what you guessed? So I'll show both there. There's the original one. It reflects itself right over. OK. Then if we keep going. So there's my next point. This next one's a little bit non-obvious. Non it's only because we don't have the actual numeric values. But there's a shrink in. So it, it contracts in because there's no better optimum. And then there's a shrink in, a reflection, a shrink in, a reflection, flip over, reflection. And now notice what happens to the triangle. Okay, You get that shrinking as you approach the optimum. Okay, so that's all the simplex method is, is a sequence of these four basic steps. Reflection, expansion, um, contraction, or shrink. Will it always work? Sorry? Will it always work? It will, it will generally always work. There's a few exceptions. OK, so let's, um, let's get a bit more practice with this. On the third page, you've got the algorithm there at the bottom of page 2 and the top of page 3. But can you identify what steps are being taken when we go from 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4 there?
Okay, so one to two is reflection, two to three. So um, maybe let me emphasize here, th where is, if you were the simplex algorithm and you currently had this, uh, the, those three points at simplex two, what is your first, first thing to check? Follow the algorithm at the bottom of page two. You've got your three data points, that's step one. Okay, so step two is to calculate the centroid. Where's the centroid? On, is it on this edge here? This is where you started, right? So then the first algorithm flipped that over. So that's, these are your three data points. Which one of these three is the, the best two? These two over here. These are your best two function values, and that's your worst one. So the algorithm says your centroid is somewhere on the point on the line midway connecting these two points. So there's your centroid. Draw it in with your ruler if you want to. And then do the reflection step. The reflection step is going to take this point over and make it land over here. Is that an improvement in the, in the function value? Yeah. So we're going to keep it. Okay. There's also a step that says try to expand. And when we expand, that point is going to move over here. We're going to see that we've actually gotten worse, so we go back to our reflection. So we're going to keep that point. So that's the result of simplex 3, is this larger triangle. So simplex going from step 3 to 4 is actually a contraction or a shrink? Contraction, OK? So shrink, you can identify a shrink because it keeps, it keeps the shape of the triangle and just pulls it interior. But contraction is it flips inside. So 4 to 5. Yeah, if you look at the shrink on the previous page, shrink just slides the two points along the vertices. OK, so 3 to 4. 4 to 5. We've just got one person answering. 4 to 5. Yeah, OK, cool. Uh, 5 to 6. Reflection. 6 to 7. Reflection. 7 to 8. Reflection. OK, so we're, we're good at this. Now let's try an actual problem yourself. Yeah, Mark? You shrink towards the best points, yeah. OK, so, so when you're, when you're shrinking, you're close to the end. shrinking is typically done when you're close to the end, okay. yeah. You, because you, as you approach the optimum, you can't have such a large triangle anymore. OK, so let's try it on our, on our own problem. There's a website URL given to you there, and you don't know what that function is. All you know that it's a distillation column, and there's the reflux ratio and the feed flow rate that you're varying. And if you flip over to page 4, I've given you three starting points, just so that we all start at the same location. But even in practice, no one gives you the starting triangle. You, you will come up with this. And the way I've, I chose the starting triangle is that my base case was with a feed flow rate of 320 and a reflux ratio of 2.5. So then I picked the other two data points. And go to that website address yint.org slash nm for Neldamid. You can do this on your phone. You can do this on, a, on any device. OK, and I'd like you to evaluate the function. It's actually given to you at the bottom of page 3 are the, f the first three function evaluations. Is it working for everyone? Maybe it doesn't. yint.org.nm. 
Or is it the drone back still? You probably just check your... Okay, so what I'd like you to do is fill in that table. There's the first three function values. Confirm my value of xc. You should make sure you can do that. And then calculate delta x. So I've, I'm giving you the first step in the algorithm. I'm doing the reflection. I'm doing the expansion. So make sure that at least you understand what I've done over here. And then you can move on. So I'll give you a few minutes to work through that. It's the first iteration of the Nelda Mead algorithm. The best thing you can probably do for yourself is to sketch those points on the plot on page four so that you can track where it's moving in, in th two dimensions. Have it here? Yep. Okay. Makes sense for you, Rihong? So on page four, draw the triangle, draw the centroid, draw delta x. So follow the formula, xr. No, xc is your centroid. Yeah. So use it. Do do it algebraically and geometrically. That's the purpose of this exercise. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so use the formulas. You can do this geometrically, but use the formulas as well. For xc, make sure that xc is where you think it is, and then verify geometrically that it's where, you, where your intuition tells you it is. The formula is given to you, right? All the formulas are... 
Okay, so for those of you that are, uh, you don't have to wait for me, you can keep going with this, but if you haven't done this already and figured it out, delta x then is equal to xc minus the worst x. So in this case, n plus 1 is the third x value. xc is calculated as simply the midpoint between there and the formula is given to you on page 1 for xc. Delta x then Make sure and pause before you simply just follow this, that it, it makes intuitive sense. It's telling you to go a negative amount in, in the first variable and a positive amount in the second variable. And that makes sense as well. We're seeing directions of improvement, minimum cost are in that way, which is decrease in x1 and an increase in, in x2. So that's intuitive and matches with our expectation. Okay, and then your next step is then to go calculate XR, the reflection. The formula is given to you on page one. This is your next iteration, right? So there's your three triangle points. Yeah. Because your new point is like you, your reflective value is 1.5320. You get a value of 300. Yeah. Which is still larger than the best point. Yeah, but it's got to be better. 300, it lies. Yeah, so it's successful. 
Because he's the right between the best yeah. point. Yeah, so if it lo lies between those two, then it's, it's not considered successful. Uh, so what lies between those two, it is. But why does it snow? Because you get a value of 247. So expansion improved, but you go back to... It's, the expansion is only... Read the formula here, right? Expansion is considered successful when it's better than x1. Okay. Yeah. Nice. You guys are making good progress. How's yours looking? Oh, okay. You haven't drawn it in. Okay. Uh, when we're doing the function calls, do we have to evaluate it xc? No. You, you, you. Strictly speaking, you do if you want to follow this. Yeah, I, I was just yeah. asking because, like, it, I see that you like we did, and then it says like we we do one. Function yeah, you do it so that you can check convergence because at the optimum, x c has got to be numerically close to the other. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Is that sort of the right track, and then I'm I haven't got myself gone beyond that one. I, I, depending on how you, yeah, I think you do go back over there. I just that part I'm not sure of. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Was it? Yeah. So 243 is less than 312, right? So it's successful, so that's why we go to the expansion as well. Yeah, so if the, ex if the reflection is successful, you also try the expansion, right? It's the same, it's, so you go over here, if you get an improvement, why don't you, you try going a little bit more? If, it, if that's not enough of improvement, you go back to where you were. Yeah? Okay, so let's, uh, let's just pull everyone together. You've had a good chance to calculate XC, so I'm, I'm confident you can calculate centroids. Um, you've had a chance to calculate the reflection value as well. The reflection value is take your centroid value plus your delta x. So I'll, I'll do it here geometrically. So we've calculated that point and it will lie, whatever that distance is, that's delta x. We can then just take it and add it on over here. So you'll get a new point that looks some, a new triangle that looks like that. So this is your, your candidate value for reflection. And when you evaluate the function at xr, you got a value of 243. So 243 is lower than any other value you currently have in your current simplex. So our reflection is worth keeping. But then we say, well, what about expanding it even further still? So we give it a try and go even further out to this location over here. So take two delta x steps. And if you did that, that's your expansion trial. You get a value of 247. Now 247 is, is an improvement, but it's not as much as an improvement as xr was. Okay, so that, this is a better value than 247. So our expansion then is deemed to be unsuccessful. And we'll go back to keeping our reflection instead. So on the next iteration now, my simplex becomes the points connected here. Okay. Now where's x1, x2, x3? x1, x2, x3 get relabeled. So this point over here is my best value. That becomes my x1. 312 is my next best point. That becomes x2. And my value up here at 334, that becomes x3. And I repeat the iteration from the beginning at that location. So I start with finding my centroid. My centroid geometrically is over there. You can go f use the formula, and you should use the formula to do this. And then reflect across that point, And your next iteration lands up over there. Okay, So that's the reflection. 
And the value that you get over here, this is the third line in the table. So it's 1.5 and 320 on the, in terms of location. And the function value at that point is 300. Okay, so let's, uh, let's just quickly ask ourselves, we currently have these three values, 312, 243, and 334. 300 fits in between 243 and 312. So it's between my lowest point and my next uh, lowest point. So do I retain it? Is that an improvement? Yes, it is. It's certainly lower than 334. It's uh, lower than 312, but it's not quite as low as 243. So it is an improvement. We keep, we keep it over there. Right. Now you can go try and do an expansion as well. You can go try and expand further still, and what you'll find is that the function drops off. So you'll come back again, this time to your reflection at 300. So on the next iteration now, your revised simplex is now given by the red triangle over here. Okay. So I'm, by leaving this function available to you on the website, I'm hoping that you can go take this, treat this like a tutorial or an assignment problem, and take this a step further now. Reflect, expand, shrink, contract, and uh, see that you can converge to the optimum.